Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to another exciting episode of America Adapts. We're going to be talking to experts about flooding, art, and community engagement. This is the second episode in a four-part series I'm doing with Anita Van Breda of World Wildlife Fund. For those who thought this was a three-part series, well, we got so much excellent content, we had to expand it to four episodes. Anita joins me again on these interviews, and I'll go into more detail on what we hope to accomplish with this series, but the overall goal is to highlight all the complexities associated with flood management. Needless to say, the first episode was incredibly popular. I hope you enjoy the second one. We have a lineup of interesting guests who focus on creative ways to communicate around this topic of flooding. Community engagement is always a challenge, and these three innovative thinkers share their experiences on effective ways to engage. And we'll dig into the role of climate change, and we'll talk about nature-based solutions to flooding. I want to highlight that this four-part series has been generously sponsored by World Wildlife Fund. I greatly appreciate their interest in using podcasting as a storytelling device to share important information. They have been great partners. I encourage you to check out the resources they provide in my show notes. We want this series to become a major resource to not only flood planners, but the general public that wants to be better informed on what's happening in this critical area of disaster management. Okay, some brief housekeeping. I start a new thing for the podcast, Letters from Adapters. I'll try to do two each episode, but I'm very limited for time in this one, so I'm just going to include one. But this is a great one. This is from Terry Tiedemann from Santa Cruz. Hi, Doug. I'm not an adaptation professional. I actually am a caregiver for my ex-girlfriend who is disabled. Caregiving is very rewarding and super important job, but can be, for me, pretty boring at times. So I try to keep stimulated and engaged by educating myself when I have bits of free time. I started studying climate change a few years back and got quickly hooked. I heard the Climate One podcast on the local NPR radio station and quickly listened to most of their library of podcasts. I started searching Google Play and for other climate change related podcasts and found yours. I've been working my way through your episodes for a couple months now. I certainly think of myself as an adapter, even if not professionally. I'm not sure if this counts according to your definition of adaptation, but here are some ways I think and apply climate adaptation in my life as a non-professional. There's certainly some mitigation crossover in these actions, of course. One, here in Santa Cruz, I grow pretty much all my own produce year-round in my front yard, garden, and trade for homegrown eggs with a neighbor. Not only is this fun, but but if it catches on as a trend, it could help adapt to potential climate-related food insecurity. At least 10 neighbors have told me they have started their own gardens because of being inspired by ours. Two, I walk, bike, and use electric skateboard for pretty much all my local transportation, which helps reduce traffic congestion, increases community engagement. This may be a stretch as an adaptation action, but if enough people get out of their cars, it could significantly change the city landscape and city planning. Three, I'm planning on switching to a composting toilet in the near future and installing rainwater harvesting to adapt to our drought-prone watershed. And four, I'm Also working on getting off natural gas and switching all appliances to electric before installing solar to help take pressure off the grid. I think of life like an orchestra. We all have different parts to play, but if we can harmonize and work together, we can create something beautiful. P.S. Thanks for the content and keep up the great work. Cheers, Terry. All right, Terry. No, thank you. What an awesome email. Thanks for what you do and thanks for your interest in climate adaptation. It is an emerging issue and it comes in many shapes. I think we will see a merging of mitigation and adaptation in the years to come and probably including many of the things that you do. But thanks again for writing. Super cool. Upcoming episodes. Next up is mainstreaming adaptation with Sean Martin of World Wildlife Fun. And I'm also doing another end of the year episode, which is so much fun to do. I'll have a guest panel going over the big stories of the year. Just a reminder, your favorite reminder. America Adapts is a charitable organization that that needs your support. Please consider giving a tax-deductible donation. You can find the links to the We Did It Donate page in the show notes. This is a group that actually takes the donations. I am a 5013 in case you're interested. Also, if you're interested in sponsoring a specific podcast or having me speak at a public or corporate event, please reach out. I've been doing some keynote presentations, and they are a lot of fun. I share stories from the podcast and my own experiences in adaptation and give my insights on where I think we're going. Okay, adapters, let's join our guests and get creative. Hey, adapters, welcome back to a very exciting episode of America Adapts. Before we jump into this episode, I wanted to check in with Anita Van Breda from the World Wildlife Fund. 
By now, most of you know Anita very well. She was on the previous flooding episode, episode one, and she's here for part two. Hey, Anita, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Doug. How are you? I am doing great. Welcome back to the podcast. I always love having you on. And so I hate to do this because most of my listeners probably know who you are, and Anita will be joining me for all these interviews, but could you briefly just explain who you are? Sure. I'm the Senior Director for Environment and Disaster Management at World Wildlife Fund, and I'm part of our climate change adaptation and resilience team. Okay, so this is the second episode in now a four-part series, and we'll get it. We'll explain that a little bit later. Since this is our second episode on flooding, why is World Wildlife Fund so interested in the topic of flooding? So in my program, we look at how to integrate environmentally responsible practices into disaster recovery and reconstruction. And floods are the number one disaster around the world. But we in WWF, we also, as you know, work on a lot of different ecosystems and environmental management issues. And we find there uh, is a good combination in this issue's around flooding in terms of reducing risk to future disasters such as floods, but also trying to maximize the benefits that we can get from a natural process such as flooding. So we want to reduce risk for people, keep people safe, but also use environmentally responsible practices to be part of a flood management portfolio, if you will. Okay, I want to encourage people to go back to episode one and listen to that one. But could you do just a really brief recap? Who did we talk to and what did we talk about in that first episode? So the the flood uh, series episode is part of our project on natural and nature-based flood management, which is a guidebook that we wrote in partnership with the U.S. Agency for International Disaster. And in episode one, we were lucky to have expert from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who was part of our advisory group for this project, really talking about some of the fundamentals around the history and tradition of flood management, particularly in the U.S. But then we also had a research scientist from the Netherlands from a company called Del Taris, who was talking about the Dutch experience with flood management. And as we know, they have literally thousands of years of experience in the Netherlands to share. And they're also looking at how this issue is moving into the future. And then we had Jeff Opperman, who's our freshwater scientist at WWF. And he did a great job of explaining some of the natural processes around water management and flood management. So between those three experts, we can, we laid the foundation of some of the issues past, present, and future with flood management. The, that episode has been out now, I think, about six weeks, two months. It's been out for a bit now. What has the reception been for that first episode? It's been really good. It's been really interesting. We've had requests from folks who would like to get access to our guidebook and some of the learning resources that we have on our website. And as you and I have talked about before, we really need to be constantly learning if we're going to practice adaptation and disaster risk reduction. So to have the opportunity to engage with people through this way of communicating on a podcast has been really helpful. On my end, the reception has been fantastic. I thought since I was co-hosting it with you that my numbers were going to dive. But no, that wasn't the case. The numbers have been incredible for that episode. So thanks, Anita. I I was thinking ill of you, but it's been (laughs) the most popular episode I've had in probably three or four months. It's just really done well. And what's really been interesting is the feedback has come from people that are in flooding management, but then just people with the general public that are just very interested in hearing about these issues and tying it into climate change. So I'm very excited about that. And so I'm so glad I'm not dragging down your numbers, Doug. (laughs) Oh, we'll see now. Knock on wood. On that note, is this is in some ways the sequel to episode one. And as everyone knows, Empire Strikes Back was a superior film to Star Wars. I want this episode to be a superior episode if we can make it. And I think, well, you know what? We don't want to diss that first episode, but it's really good. Yeah. And and I'll just put in a plug for the past as well as the future episodes. Each one is going to be so different because the whole topic of flood management, which I find fascinating because it's so different and involves so many different issues, profession, sectors, and points of view. So stay tuned, listeners, to great episodes to come as well as this one on number two. Okay, so who are we going to hear from in this episode? So in this episode, we're going to hear from a range of different people who have 
expertise and experiences in art and communication. And your listeners may, may be wondering, what does art and communication have to do with flood management? A lot. The number one issue, the thing that we in flood management struggle with probably the most is how to engage people in the process of understanding what flood risk is and then how to address it. And so we're going to hear from people who are educators who use documentary film as a way of engaging people in a way as teaching students. And we're going to hear from an artist who uses a range of different medium, mediums to engage young people as well as others. And then we have a research scientist who's working in Chicago who comes from a public health background but is now working on engaging community members um, in the on the issue of climate change adaptation and flood management they were fantastic conversations i'm looking forward to sharing these with all you guys out there and so without further ado let's jump into these conversations and anita is going to be back with me at the end and we're going to do a short little roundup but um all right anita let's get started looking forward to it doug Hey, Adapters, I'm talking with Dr. Vidya Venkat Ramanan. Vidya is a postdoctoral fellow in the Anthropology Department at Northwestern University. Vidya focuses on how community engagement and participation can improve the implementation of water sanitation and hygiene and environmental sustainability programs. Welcome to the podcast, Vidya. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for having me. Well, that was a very simple introduction. I try to do a little bio for all my guests, but is there a bit more information you, you would like to share? On the, I'm sure your work is much more complicated than that. I mean, I think a lot of the stuff doesn't end up being rocket science, but you know, working with people is often one of the most challenging things. So I think the one thing I would say is that the kind of work and research that I do really is at the intersection of technologies and human behavior. So it's trying to understand how do human beings interact with what we kind of think of traditionally more of engineering or technological domains. And so how can we adapt programs and interventions that really tend to have more of a technical, technological focus, but how can we adapt them based on how people will be interacting with these technologies, will be benefiting from them? Um, so that ranges from water, sanitation, hygiene programs, and also flood management, so overabundance of water as well. Okay, that was a much richer explanation of what you do. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so you do work all over the world, and, and it looks like you've had an interesting journey. So what has led you from international relations to international health, and now it looks like you're focusing on community engagement and water at Northwestern University. Can you describe that journey a little bit? Sure. So I, I grew up in India, Philippines, and Japan, so I got to experience a lot of very diverse contexts, both in terms of just geographically and culturally, but also socioeconomically. And so I, a lot of public health and development issues were really at the forefront of my life growing up, whether it was poor sanitation or flooding. And so I got into public health to really try to understand infectious diseases and sanitation um, behavior. And that took me down the road of, you know, communities are ultimately what matter. And so I studied and worked in trying to understand community-led approaches to improving rural sanitation around Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Caribbean, and realized more recently that, you know, a lot of these tools and techniques and lessons learned from working in lower middle-income settings around the world also apply to my very own neighborhood here in Chicago. And so that really got me more interested in trying to understand domestic issues around water, around flooding, around the environment. And so the kind of work that I'm starting to work on now here at Northwestern is really very domestic. And how do people interact with nature and nature-based solutions? Um, how do people experience flooding? And what kind of technologies and solutions can we have both, um, you know, in terms of the hardware, so actual flood protection mechanisms, but also the software really engaging with communities and raising awareness to try to improve people's life. I don't know if you work with them at all. Uh, this was a long time ago, but it, are you involved with Chicago Wilderness? I always thought they sort of had an interesting mission there. Have you heard of them? Very much so, yeah. I'm actually um, on the uh, advisory board for their climate change adaptation for the prairies in the Midwest. Um, so we were just at a meeting just on Monday to talk about how can we basically create a climate adaptation plan for this entire region that takes both the conservation goals into account, but also people's and communities' perspectives and how they will be engaging with nature. So it's actually very relevant. I always thought that was a bit of a bold name, Chicago Wilderness, not two words you typically associate with each other. 
Yep. So you are involved with community and that means a lot to different people. So how would you just define in the scope of your work what community engagement is? That's a really great question. I think that's usually what I start off with is this definition of community. What does it mean? I think it can mean so many different things in depending on the context, as you said. And so even in the work that I have done and am doing and will continue to try to do, it's going to have different definitions. But I think one of the maybe the underlying themes behind it is really trying to understand in a deeper way what people's perspectives are, what their priorities are, kind of co-producing. Um, I know that sometimes uses a buzzword, but I think it really is meaningful co-producing the 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 knowledge, the interventions and the impacts with people um, and keeping them as, you know, the, the people who are actually going to end up benefiting from the project, keeping them in mind and involved in the process from the beginning all the way through to the end. So it's not just paying lip service to this idea that like, oh, we're just going to work with communities, but really trying to understand, is your community the neighborhood? Is it the block? Is it the city um, overall, or is it just certain socioeconomic groups or racial groups? Um, and it really will completely depend. So that's sort of the first step is to ask that question. Okay, so community engagement can be broadly defined. So think about in the context of flood management, does community engagement kind of take on its own persona when you're dealing specifically with that issue? Again, I hate to say that it's always <laughs> dependent on the context, but it really is. I mean, if you're talking about a flood management intervention that's at a very, very local level, then your community is likely going to be the, say, the households, the sort of, if it's in a rural setting, the village cluster um, or hamlets. Um, in an urban setting, like the work we're starting to do in Chicago, it's going to be at the block level. So that will be our community. And that's how we would then start to get people's perspectives and priorities and start to say who should be at the table, who all should be at the table as we're designing this work. But if your flood management intervention project program is really done at the city level, you're going to bring in a variety of different community stakeholders. So at that point, you're going to bring in a lot of say, urban planners, um, flood management experts. You're going to bring in other community leaders that may not be in an you know, immediate sense, very obvious partners at the table, but you're talking about an intervention at the city level. So you want to be sure to involve, say, sanitation engineers, bring all of these folks to the table. Some of the folks that we've been talking to have expressed the challenge, and and we've seen it as well in the development of our our flood green guide. That if you're bringing in the community, the, the so-called community, at the point where you've decided on your intervention, then it's already too late, and that the community needs to be and the people, as you eloquently defined them need to be brought in at the get-go in terms of even the definition of of the problem. So can can you comment on that a bit in terms of in the continuum of understanding what is the flood risk in a place, who defines that problem and how in terms of your expertise around community engagement, would would you agree that it's advantageous to bring people, the people, in the very early stages to help define the problem before you start choosing technical solutions. Yeah, I think that's actually one of the the main points that, um, as you know, social scientists, as people who kind of work in the realm of community based research, we try to really emphasize is this need to start very early when you're engaging with the community. I think we've seen this example, and it goes far beyond just um, flood management, but we've seen this in every domain, I would say, that community engagement is really something where you're informing the community of what you're doing. And I think that defeats the purpose. So it really is very important to bring them in. And maybe you'll realize that what say you as a technical person thought was the main flood risk challenge in this community is not really the main priority for people who live there. And it's something else. And so really doing that initial stage of understanding their priorities and perspectives will help shape the kind of project that you might want to implement in that place. So do you have examples or recommendations for the folks that are working on those types of interventions, methods or techniques or approaches for community engagement that they that they can make at those earliest stages of a process? Yeah, there are actually a variety of, of social science methods that are available, participatory research methods and 
participatory appraisal methods that are there. And I just used all of these technical terms, but really sometimes that pushes people away saying, oh, you're just going to be doing some kind of rigorous research. We don't have the means for that. But I think these tools and methods are really applicable in a very practical way to trying to engage with communities from the beginning. So a clear example is a community meeting or focus group discussions that you can do as part of and the research side, we'll call it formative research, but it can be called whatever you want. The idea is that you are first introducing yourself to this community that I'm putting in quotes because mm-hmm. in air quotes because of the definition of it. But you're going in and you're saying, this is what it is that you want to, that you're thinking of doing. But tell us about your experience. Tell us about your life. Tell us about how flooding affects you. And through that process, you start to understand, oh, In some cases, maybe flooding really isn't the immediate concern, but there's actually something down the road that needs to be addressed first before we get to flooding. And that's really those community meetings and those very open-ended questions where you're really trying to learn from someone can help you figure out what it is that you want to accomplish with the community. Thank you. You have a bit of a history with Anita working as a trainer on the Flood Green Guide in the, a workshop in Bangkok earlier this year. What did you learn from that experience and did it affect your thinking at all on flood management? It was a fascinating experience. And I do have to thank Anita and the World Wildlife Fund for giving me that opportunity to participate because so often I've seen that community engagement and the social sciences broadly and, you know, all of these kinds of, I'm going to again put in air quotes, soft <laughs> terms that are used. Um, don't get brought to the table when we're talking about these kinds of technological or engineering based interventions. And so it was really very lovely to be involved in that approach and to be working with. So the, the participants that we had who were from, if I remember correctly, nine or 10 countries around Asia who are largely thinking about flood risk management from the very problem solving kind of approach and standpoint, viewpoint. And by bringing in this community perspective, which we brought in actually as one of the last activities in the workshop, it gave them an opportunity to think about what are all the stages of the process in which we could involve communities and how would we do that? So at first, there was a little bit of um, hesitation, confusion about what exactly we were going to be doing. But I noticed that by the end of our session, people seem to have really taken some of these ideas to heart. And it was really exemplified by the next day. This was the third day of the workshop. Um, all the participants in their groups had to come up with a flood risk management plan, a very interactive plan, very visually interactive plan. And I was really very, it really warmed my heart to see that all the groups incorporated the community at the center of their plan. Um, and really st- talked about doing these focus group discussions and meetings and trying to do interviews with key informants in the community to try to understand, one, what the needs were, but whether their projects were actually going to be effective or not. And these are really incorporated into their plans, which to me was a sign, okay, this can actually be integrated um, into flood risk management planning in a very, very useful way. Well, that's actually a compliment to you, too, Rudia, that you were able to connect with those participants in the way that you did and influence their thinking and their behavior. So so it's our thanks to you for helping make that a reality. And we're hoping to carry all of that good work and approach forward in future training. So you helped lay the groundwork for really emphasizing the, the key role that this this unwieldy topic calls community engagement in air quotes, what that really means for flood risk management. I just wanted to ask you, though, one one other quick follow-up. So the Flood Green Guide is about promoting and supporting the use of natural and nature-based methods as part of a flood risk management portfolio. Do you think or do you have any experiences with or could you comment on, is there anything different about natural and nature-based flood management methods for this topic? versus any other topic or, you know, is it all the same when it comes to community engagement? So my uh, my theory on this is, and and I'm not going to say this as a declarative statement by any means, but what I what I observe, um, especially with my background in uh, rural sanitation um, as well, is that nature based methods offer an opportunity, but also a, a major obstacle in terms of acceptance and adoption of this kind of approach um, by people. On the one side, you have for, for millennia, people have been 
using floods right, to help them um, and have been have their own nature based methods have always had nature based methods of working around flooding. And so using it to their benefit, but also protecting themselves from harmful floods. And so that's an opportunity for me is to try to tap into the historical kind of uh, precedent that we have for using nature to both help and you know protect us. The obstacle that I see is, uh, and this is where I draw the parallel with with sanitation technologies, where we often try to put, you know, have people kind of try to adopt composting toilets, which is something I'm very <laughs> passionate about. But it, there's a barrier to entry there because what people have seen is that we like these big, large, gray engineered systems is sort of aspirational. It's what we want. So while people might say that, oh, it's great that you're going to, you know, put in a rain garden or help us sort of reconstruct our wetland here. Um, we want to see something. We want to see cement. We want to see something um, that's built that's going to actually protect us. And trying to convince people of the benefits, of the many different benefits that are available for nature-based methods, as opposed to the traditional gray methods, that's where I see the barrier, is around perceptions and aspirations. Right. So we have our work cut out for us, in other words. <laughs> Most definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, just, I think of in Georgia, they were trying to expand the riparian areas from 15 feet to like 50 feet because that was going to mm-hmm. play a big role in water quality. And it just was pulling teeth to extend it out that way. And of course it was, you know, you go through your local commission and there's all these sort of hoops they jump through. And I get what you're saying is that sometimes that is, and it gets in the way of actually doing things more quickly versus the voluntary model, which has its own problems. But yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah, I, I found it's a challenge everywhere and in some places where I've worked, Doug, internationally where we've tried to support that approach. People just move into those spaces because they have a few choices elsewhere. So, and particularly in urban areas, it's very difficult to conceive and design and develop and then enforce that type of land use planning. And that's always a big key anywhere, no matter what country you're in. Uh, land use planning is such a key to managing flood risk and can be difficult under the best of circumstances, no matter which end you're coming from. Exactly. And, you know, using the example of, of India, I mean, when you have such intense population pressures as well um, in a lot of a lot of large cities. But, you know, in, in India, a small town is, is a large city in another uh, context. And so you have challenges there that, as Anita was saying, even if you do have all of these different laws in place, you have, even if you have willing and interested partners in the local government and the city government, the state government, um, who understand the value of nature-based methods for flood risk management or any kind of flood risk management options, they're often just unable to really implement them, one in the face of population pressure, but often also in the face of corruption. And that can be one of those less spoken about challenges that, that, that we face. So, you know, just uh, earlier this year, late last year, we had intense flooding um, in devastating flooding in the state of Kerala in South India. And, you know, the what came out of that was that they already had reports from 10 years ago saying these are all of the different types of um, interventions that needed to be in place to prevent a catastrophic flooding. None of it was actually implemented in practice. Um, and it's not simply because we often just would then like to blame um, the state government or the central government. And it's really a, a confluence of different factors that don't allow that to happen. I just, I just have a couple more questions. And I don't know, Anita, you, you have a couple, but I'll just I'll transition to those. Did, did Go ahead. You, well, this is kind of a you know, <laughs> put you on the spot here, but it, what's your experience with storytelling as part of community engagement? And I think you've sort of touched upon it a little bit in some of your answers, but has that played a role at all? It's going to increasingly play a role. I'll put it that way. The work that I've done thus far has, and I, I, I should just be honest to admit that it it hasn't been in the fully, fully participatory way that I would want work to be. And so I'm using the work that we're going to be doing in Chicago as an opportunity to really engage in a much more meaningful way. Um, and so one of those aspects is, is through storytelling. I am working also with the Nature Conservancy here in Illinois, and we're, we're trying to get some community-based research going in communities that live around a, a prairies, very urban prairies that are really the last um, holdouts in, um, in southern, uh, sort of south of Chicago and in the suburbs. And we want to really try to understand people's experiences there, people's um, experiences with nature, with conservation, with flooding, and with flood-based management. 
Um, and so the way that we're going to do this uh, is through storytelling and is through capturing people's narratives and then hopefully also sharing our learnings and potentially in the future uh, interventions through more of this kind of engagement, through really trying to not to, to try to like, I guess, communicate in the most effective manner that is helpful to the communities with which we work and also for us to learn. All right. That was a very useful answer. It's not easy, but uh, <laughs> it's a resource. This has been fabulous. I, this is a lot of really useful information, and I think it's going to complement this as part of our three-part flood episode series that America Adapts is doing with World Wildlife Fund. And is there any uh, resources, if people, some people listening to what we're talking about here, that you would recommend any online resources or any particular specific things that you'd recommend? Would it be would it be a little too um, of an insider thing for me to say that I would plug the Flood Green Guide? <laughs> you go ahead, um, plug think, it. <laughs> we we, think, we link to it. We link it every show, every episode. That it'll be in the show notes, so it'll be there. You don't have to worry about that one. You can, you can yeah. plug it. We may cut it out later, but we will always take shameless promotion. <laughs> I mean, I, I really would. Yeah, no, I really would would say that. Um, I mean, I, I mean this very genuinely. Uh, that when I did have the opportunity earlier this summer to read the entire Food Green Guide cover to cover. I found it to be a very helpful piece. And, you know, you can't cover every topic in there, of course. But I do think that all, all of the different sections in this guide that allude to community engagement, citizen science, um, monitoring and evaluation, the guide itself provides a lot of different resources for people to read more. And so I think that to me would be really the, the primary document or resource that's available right now for specifically for community engagement for, for nature based methods. But we're also, um, if I, if I can sort of plug a little bit of the work that we're doing is systematic reviews of the evidence on community engagement and community impact, social and health impacts of nature based methods for flood management. And so we're finding there that there isn't much really useful information there at the moment. A lot of it is talking about the need for it, but the actual evidence isn't quite there. So that's something that we're gathering um, together and we'll hopefully be able to share um, in the near future. But I think that one of the, if I could just sort of make this one point that I don't think the resources that are need to be tailored very specifically to this topic of nature-based methods for flood risk management. I think a lot of these tools are available um, across the sphere of community-based work that has been going on for hundreds of years. And so there are many great resources in terms of um, the terms I would sort of throw out there are participatory rural appraisal or PRA and community-based participatory research or CBPR. These are really two methods that help people. Um, this is not about academic ivory tower research, but that actually help organizations um, really try to do work with communities as opposed to just doing it for communities. Fabulous answers. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was incredible information. I think it's it's really complimentary to uh, some of the other information we've been getting in these interviews, but I really appreciate your time and, and the work that you do. Thank you so much for having me. And Anita, do you want any final words? No, thank you, Vidya. This has been great and so informative and inspiring. And yes, it does align nicely with some of our other discussions and further resources we'll be able to share with you, particularly in terms of storytelling. So thank you. Okay, perfect. That's a wrap. Okay. <laughs> Great. I like saying that part. <laughs> hey, adapters. I'm talking with Professor Elizabeth Miller, a documentary maker and professor in communication studies based at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. Welcome to the podcast, Liz. Thank you. All right. So you're involved with, with a lot of things, but I, I guess first off, I, I just want to start with the Shoreline Project. And could you briefly summarize what, what's that all about? Well, sometimes I describe the Shoreline Project as an interactive storybook or an alternative test, um, textbook for the future. And the whole idea was to bring solution-based stories about issues around climate change and sustainability to a form that would be open and accessible and of interest to wide audiences like students or community groups. And so in the project, we have 43 unique short films that play out along our global coast. And we found 
inspiring portraits of people making change along the coast from nine different countries. Is this just something like a project you were able to get funded out of the university or were there sort of external partners? Because it seemed like, I mean, it's a pretty good looking series of short films and such. Basically, in Canada, as a university professor, we have this unique fund that is about research creation. And the idea is what kind of innovative forms of research can we discover through partnerships, through new forms of media. And so I've been interested in what I'll call environmental justice for years. And I began thinking about this new form of documentary, which can be called interactive documentary or open documentary. And I thought I would put these two passions I have together, which is documentary practice and environmental justice. And the research question was basically, how can we get innovative tools into classrooms around the world on cutting edge in, in extremely important issues like flooding, like climate change, sea level rise? And how can we do this in a way that inspires people rather than you know makes people feel discouraged or worried about the future? How can storytelling be at the core of this? And that was the premise. Anita, do you have a question? I think this issue around storytelling is so interesting. And when I think about the work that I've done and my team has done over the last few years, putting the Flood Green Guide together and the opportunity that afforded us to meet with and talk to and work with such a wide range of individuals and actors and organizations from so many different disciplines. And we're hoping that the the Flood Green Guide and the promotion of natural and nature-based features as a flood management method will help inspire people to have a different vision of the future and a different vision of managing floods. So I wanted to ask your thoughts about the role of storytelling and the role of storytelling in affecting change and changing human behavior and changing the way that people look at the world and look at the future and maybe what you learned about that through the Shoreline Project. At Concordia, I teach a class called Media and in the and the Environment. And basically, over 13 weeks, we look at all of the different issues that we are confronted with as a planet. And we're looking at it from a wide range of storytelling practices, but also a wide range of issues. And inevitably, at some point in the semester, the students will just begin to feel like, feel fright, frightened and discouraged. And in thinking about this carefully, I realized that a really critical part of how we get people involved in planning for the future is about the kinds of stories that we're telling. And so this project was really designed for my students in mind. And what I wanted, the kinds of stories that I wanted to tell were very local stories with ordinary people doing innovative things. So, for example, one of the stories is a young girl named Safali, and she is a high school student who became passionate about the environment. She was doing some leadership training. And in this leadership training, they encourage young girls to dream big. And her idea was to plant a thousand trees around her island in order to protect it from future storms. And in order to do this, she had to get every student in her school to contribute five rupees. And in getting these uh, five rupees was like the first step of engagement. And then she got all of her students to help her plant these, these trees around the island. And so this kind of action taken by young people that involves people in their immediate community that doesn't feel like out of range was precisely the kind of solution-based storytelling that I that I wanted to find. So we cast our net really wide um, and began seeking out engineers, youth activists, teachers, artists, people who were doing things that that anybody could identify with. Because I think the, the challenge is um, using stories to encourage people to opt into actions, local actions, and primarily what I like to say is collaborative actions. Like there is a lot going on in our world that is out of our control, like storms and flooding um, that is frightening and discouraging. But there's a lot of things that we can manage. And 
part of that is is learning how to work together and finding the joy in working together. And so many documentary stories are based on people making difficult decisions or people confronting crisis. And I wanted to frame this kind of story around people making difficult decisions, but around things that were changing their communities. Who's your target audience for the website and just all the, I'm assuming that the films are probably just, you know, you can find them individually on YouTube and such, but like who really was your target audience when you started developing these? So interactive documentary is a form of documentary practice that has been really taking place in Canada because there's, there's quite a bit of funding for innovation in the forum. And one of the research questions I had was, who is the target audience? This is a form of documentary that's free, that's accessible online. But my feeling was, what if I designed an interactive documentary primarily for the classroom? Um, many of the work that I've done in the past has been for film festivals or for television audiences. But the way we communicate is shifting so quickly that I wanted to think carefully about um, the, a target audience. And so also realizing that the beauty of this project is that you have 43 stories from all over the world. And in a place like a classroom, what you can do is watch like 10 of them and stage a conversation. A friend of mine who I was just visiting in Mendocino on the California coast assigned this in her classroom and she had uh, 25 students and each of them selected three stories. And then we staged a dialogue to talk about what inspired them, how they connected it to their local shoreline, what kind of local heroes they had in their community. And so it's really the short form of docu this short form of documentary, but framed within a, a collection is really about opening up conversation, but also about comparing the ways that people are adapting to upcoming challenges. Anita, did you have a follow-up? Yeah. Liz, in your experience, can anyone be a storyteller? Or if we're working on a flood management project with a team, do we need to bring in a professional storyteller or do we in that team need to become our own storytellers? And how do we go about doing that? A huge challenge in trying to communicate important issues like flooding is finding the language that people will listen to. And I think that the best way to do this is through a story. And storytelling is um, something that anybody can participate in. But it does take practice. Some people are shy. Some people get caught in the rhetoric of language that other people can't easily understand. So I know in Montreal, we have this open storytelling uh, performative session. It's called Cofabulation. And people go out and they share personal stories and it really moves people. And I think that engineers can tell stories. Students can tell stories. I think that what we have to do is combine important information that we want to communicate with heartfelt stories. And that means sometimes being vulnerable. It means sharing fear. It means sharing personal context. But that's the kind of thing that moves people. And what we want in getting people to become more aware of the issues, Anita, that you and I deeply care about, like flooding and getting people informed and, and acting, oftentimes the first thing they have to do is feel something and, and understand something. And, and a lot of times young people are really like terrific messengers for stories. Um, because they aren't, uh, they don't have all this language that can get in the way of communicating the things that we all care about. Like technical language that people maybe don't have the terminology for yet. It's just an observation on how a story sort of evolves. Uh, Anita, what, what's that small town just north of DC that, that flooded twice in like three years? What was it we were going to do? Ellicott City. Ellicott City. Ellicott City. And so to me, and maybe you don't agree, Anita, um, is it that it was a city and I think it got flooded like one of these one in 500 year, one in a thousand year flood and just a lot of dramatic footage. And I felt like there wasn't a lot of sort of human interest stories that were, the bigger story was this, why did it just keep happening in this one spot? Because it's a very narrow area, and the story sort of became this oddity of that it happened so quickly. And, I mean, we're hearing more of that, but I and, – and, I don't know if you disagree, but I just – I didn't feel like I necessarily heard a lot of the human interest stories, which generally – that's what we kind of hear a lot of stories from, but the actual, the impact itself, which I thought was interesting how the media covered it. Yeah, and I was just going to say, it, it, often the, the so-called general media, they do 
focus on the emergency and the drama involved and and then quickly pivot to a technical element of why did this happen or how did this happen from more of a technical perspective than from the human perspective but but not that's that's not always the case and i think with florence we're seeing and hearing at least i am a lot of real personal stories about um, impacts i think one of the challenges for me working in this sector promoting natural and nature based features as an element of flood management is wanting to help people envision something that they don't see all the time they don't know how to relate to it because they're used to seeing from a flood perspective a seawall or a dike or a levee or a concrete engineering that are that's fairly common people know what that is and i'm struggling to find ways to help people envision a combination of so-called gray and green infrastructure to address the changing conditions around flood management and that's where i think this issue around storytelling and engaging people and connecting with them emotionally as well as intellectually is tough and we're looking around the world for examples and the shoreline project is one that we are, we are happy to find and learn from but it's not easy to find and it's certainly not from the professional sector that i come from anyway is it taught or taught very consistently as part of the skill set that people need when they go forward into their profession so being able to find people like liz and the opportunities for learning and developing innovation that we hear coming from canada is great and we're, i'm just trying to extract what can we learn from that how can we support it how can we embed it into the way that 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 we in this flood management world do our work and consider who we need to work with and how you know it's so interesting um the reference to ellicott city and the flooding so often what we don't hear is how people are responding so you hear sometimes the technical issues of what what floods have happened in the past which is certainly important and interesting you hear sometimes about bad decisions people have made about buying property in places maybe they you know were precarious but a lot of times the way people respond in crisis can be very enlightening and very inspiring we had a story in long beach island of a man a construction worker regular guy who after hurricane sandy he organized all the school teachers at his wife's local school um into brigades to help go door to door and help people deal with the mold that was uh, growing in their homes and to inform people about how to manage these unwieldy insurance plans and so there was this kind of contrast of um a sort of delayed government response to a flood because you know it was very overwhelming with the possibility of a community coming together and i think that those are the kinds of stories that we can really learn from like he was basically saying we took he, he walked me through a to z how he got brigades in his neighborhood to begin working together and so that was a really inspiring story another inspiring story is in bangladesh we have an architect who at the age of 25 began working with a local community to reconfigure old fishing boats into floating schools because he realized that children in the neighborhood during the monsoon flooding season were often missing up to a third of their classes each year and so the idea uh came to him about the notion of floating schools and then he built a floating library so there's so many stories that are really about people moving outside of the realm of their comfort beginning to work with people and working with people with diverse expertise. And so maybe some people are going to say, well, I'm never really going to be able to tell a story. But maybe there's somebody that they know that can help them tell a story about an expertise they have. I mean, I really also think that part of this challenge of dealing with flooding is figuring out how we're going to work together in new ways. Mm -hmm. And stories are just one way but you know there's so many different ways that 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 people can come together and so 
it's discouraging to think about the challenges we have in front of us, but it's also an opportunity to figure out how to work together. And this is sort of how I've been framing it in the classrooms is we have a whole skill set that we need to develop about collaborative frameworks and how we can listen across differences, how we don't have to be right about everything. Sometimes we just need to figure out <laughs> how to compromise and get something done in a difficult moment. Mm-hmm. Now, I agree completely, but I want to challenge you a bit then on how do you capture the impact of that? What are the metrics that are used? Because to get buy-in and support from a political level or a governance level or a funding level, we're often challenged to say, show me the evidence that that sort of innovation actually works. So what can you help us with in terms of methodologies that help capture that impact? And do you mean the impact? Can you reframe that one more time so I understand the impact of storytelling or the impact of collaborative frameworks or? Well, both. Collaborative frameworks, I think people by and large understand from an intellectual point of view that to address the future and to, for example, in the application of natural and nature-based features as part of a flood management portfolio, collaboration and integration is not necessarily challenged, but the innovative types of engagement that for example, the, the Shoreline Project illustrates th- being able to use that in, in this type of integrated mm-hmm. collaboration and being able to demonstrate that that type of innovation, communication, engagement actually moves the objective forward. And how do you how do you measure that and capture it? Mm. I would say that often a story is the first step. And then a part of the creative practice is figuring out what's the next step. And so we really have to think about, I don't think a story in and of itself is enough. I think we have to think about what comes after the story. How are we using that story to foster relationships? So, for example, if I host a screening in a um, series at the university, I We'll screen a few of these films, but then I'll invite other people on stage to talk about what they're doing locally and maybe have a um, a moment in the audience where I ask people to turn to each other and share something that they're doing. There's a whole sense of people feeling moved by collective action. And a lot of times when you're at home and you're listening to the weather report and it's very um, frightening. You feel like you don't even want to go outside, let alone get involved in some activity that would help improve your community. And so the beautiful thing about films and about bringing people into collective spaces is that you begin to feel like you're not alone. And so film has that you know, magic of kind of drawing us out, bringing us into these uh, these open spaces and giving us an opportunity to sit next to somebody we may know, we may not know. Um, and begin to think together out loud. And so I think, you know, certainly the news is, is informative and helpful, but it's also finding the right spaces and venues where media can be used to instigate dialogue, conversation, connectivity. And then to your question, how do we prove that this is actually useful? I would say we have to do this through qualitative terms. You know, by talking to people, to asking people, how did you get involved in being a change maker in your society? How did you become inspired to do something rather than to opt out of community challenge that that might be around? And so many of the profiles in the shoreline actually profile how people feel like their lives were changed by getting involved. We have a beautiful portrait of a woman in um, India who was hit by a tsunami and she decided to get trained in how to read the weather. And she became a community leader. She became the breadwinner for her family. And so there were all these positive repercussions ranging from her self-esteem to her salary of why getting involved in community can matter. And we can extrapolate this. You know, a young person in a classroom who decides to lead a recycling campaign, who then goes and talks to local officials about flooding and planning, it's all about having the confidence to feel like 
what you do can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. And I just have a couple more questions here and, and more of a, a logistical question. If people want to learn more about the Shoreline Project, if you could just put a plug for it. I, I have show notes that people can get the links that way, but if you put a plug for it. And is there any sort of resource that you guys have developed that if someone wants to do something like this on their own or even a smaller scale, is is that out there? A lot of my friends have been using the site in classrooms to get students thinking about how short films ranging from like two to four minutes can be powerful modes to communicate an issue they care about. So like um, from podcasts to short films, people like the, the short films just to say, like, look how much you can communicate in a short form. The Shoreline is an open online resource. If you go to the shorelineproject.org, it is what I like to call the storybook for the future. So there's 43 short films there's soundscapes, there's a database with action-based activities, and there's even an interactive map that looks at data sets on um, a range of like mangrove coverage and, and other things. So it's really a way of us beginning to, to, to think about what is the local and how do we tell our stories in the context of um, a wider framework. So I encourage anyone to go and explore through the map or through the chapters that we've come up with and share it. Fantastic. Okay, Liz. So yeah, please share. If you have any last thoughts, I, I think you sort of summed up nicely the, the, the Shoreline Project, but if you've had any last thoughts before we wrap it up here. The beauty of being a documentary filmmaker is that you get to learn. And I learned so much while making the Shoreline. One of the things that I was really excited about in making the Shoreline was learning about living shorelines. And this notion that there are oysters and clams and wetlands and mangroves and all these ecological resources that if we protect, they can be protective of us. And I, I talked to an architect in Vancouver who said that um, an engineer had told him that it was it was actually quite easy to pick up and move an entire port. That engineers knew how to do these kind of huge infrastructural changes. But he said the one thing an engineer cannot do is restore an ecosystem. He said this is something we really have to understand if we want to move towards a more sustainable future. And it really impacted me. Yeah, that's amazing. And. Engineers are amazing and working together with engineers as an environmentalist is just so cool and so different. And that's a great observation. So the beauty of working on the shoreline is I got to interface with so many different people who are working in different capacities along the coast. And sometimes this was engineers, sometimes it was teachers. But having the opportunity to see how a scientist sees the shoreline or how an engineer sees the shoreline or how an artist sees the shoreline, or even a youth educator. It was such a gift. And I think it's when we bring all of those things together. I remember thinking when I was working alongside of a biologist, I, I said to myself, you know, they're really doing exactly what I do, which is the art of observation, the art of really looking at something and finding a way to understand it differently. And I think really there's a beauty in, in finding these ways to work together around things that we love, like the coast. So thank you so much, Liz, for coming on. That was really helpful. And I, I hope my listeners are inspired to be a bit more visually creative in some things that you're doing. But thanks again for coming on. Oh, it's my total pleasure. Thank you for having me. Hey, adapters. I'm talking with Catherine Sarah Young. Catherine is a Chinese Filipina artist, designer, and writer. She holds a Master of Fine Arts in Interaction Design from the School of Visual Arts in New York City as a Fulbright Scholar and a Bachelor's Degree in Molecular Biology and Biotechnology from the University of Philippines. She investigates nature and the tensions between nature and technology. Welcome to the podcast, Catherine. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure. And so I, I just want my listeners to know, where are you Skyping in from? Currently, I'm in Manila, and I'll be in China in like 
a few weeks. So I am sort of like in here in the interim. <laughs> I love when I have international guests, but it sometimes creates a little bit of logistical planning. But uh, thanks again for coming on. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, my first question, and we're going to go back and forth between Anita and myself, but could you, and I found this very interesting, could you please elaborate by what you mean that you investigate nature and the tensions between nature and technology? I think what I mean by that is that as human beings, we tend to control nature or seek to control it, um, usually using technology. And I think through the years, as we've seen, um, we tend to abuse it quite a bit. And it's we're kind of reaping the fruits of like what we've sown before. So when I say like investigating nature and the tension between that and tech, I'm thinking like, how can we try to live a more sustainable lifestyle? Um, how can we, as people who are currently encountering all of these climate impacts, sort of adapt to a planet where we could live in harmony with nature instead of against it? Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. And it, I think it's just, it's in a very exciting area that you're occupying. And so I, I want to defer over right now because I think the, one of the reasons that we have you on is that we, we connected with you first at in Uganda last year at the CBA 11 conference. And, and Anita, could you could you sort of provide that background question for Catherine? Yeah, thanks, Catherine, for joining us for this discussion. Uh, as Doug mentioned, we did meet in Uganda at that CBA or Community-Based Adaptation Conference. And I just was so impressed with your work and the display that you had that you were sharing with the conference goers on the work that you did with young people and youth and climate change and how you used art and design as a way of connecting with young people. And so I've been inspired to look at the role that art and design have with changing people's behavior, changing their mindset, helping people to think about and envision a different kind of future for themselves. So I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit more about that that project that first connected us and your reflections on engaging youth on some of these really complex, difficult situations. Okay. It's been a pretty long path to get to that point of us meeting in Uganda. So I have like a very eclectic background. So it's like art, science and design. So I'm really into doing interdisciplinary um, projects. But I think um, when I, through the residencies I've done, um, I've learned to use all of these and you know, a training, I guess, for the sake of um, environmental and social issues. So in 2013, when that super typhoon hit um, southern Philippines. I was in Singapore on an art science residency in a sustainability lab in Singapore. And that's when I founded um, the Apocalypse Project. So it's a platform of my work for climate change and our environmental futures. So I was doing that in so many places around the world because climate change is here and it's affecting everyone. So a lot of institutions were interested in the work I was doing. So last year, I was um, artist in residence with um, Plan International. And they asked me to do these climate change adaptation art workshops in several communities around Southeast Asia. So I was really struck by how the experiences of these kids shape their, their lives. So these are kids as young as 12 who have experienced way more than I ever had. And I was the artist who was supposed to be all about climate change, but they had experienced way more um, than I did. And I'm really into bringing art to everyone. And I thought it was really good to have their work be brought to a more like artistic venue. And the reason is usually art is for like privileged people. You know, you, you make a painting and then you hang it in a museum. But this time I wanted to showcase their work and collaborate with them because I do feel that they have a lot of perspectives about climate change since they have experienced a lot of really um, devastating impacts. Um, and that's where we met. And here we are right now. That's really interesting, Catherine. And as you know, the this podcast is about flood and flood management. And uh, part of that is climate change, but there's so many other issues involved. And, and I want to just jump to a real practical point of view and, and ask for your advice. What would you tell someone like me who works in an environmental NGO, but I'm working on flooding and I, and I collaborate with engineers and I collaborate with planners and I collaborate with water 
managers, how do I bring art and design as an engagement strategy into a flood management project? Like none of us have this kind of artistic skill set that you do. How do we go about bringing that perspective, bringing that application for engaging people through that medium in, into one of our flood management projects? I think art has a lot to do with empathy, and it's something I do think everyone has. So if you say that you don't have artistic skills, I would actually reject that and say you are an artist too, Anita. And I do think that it's something that everyone can engage in. So usually I ask with simple questions. I feel like one thing missing in the discussion about climate change is that we don't really get to know what other people's experiences are. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there's like lack of empathy. Um, Maybe when people are building things, they don't have the user in mind. So with art and design, I feel like what we can do is to really ask the people that you want to serve, like how do they see the future? And I think with art, you have a very visual way of seeing what people's perception of reality is, what people's perception of the future is. And um, since you have like a visual model in front of you, then I think it makes it clearer for people like which, um, like where are we at? Like, are we on the same page? Um, Are there things we can do differently? Um, also, I think art is a very, it really touches people in the, at the emotional and human level. And this is something that with a very serious and dry and inaccessible topic like climate change and flooding, these are topics that I think um, tend to scare a lot of people. But with art, I think this is a very positive way of empowering people to say, you know, we, there are things we, like climate change is already here, but there are ways where we could actually step up and empower ourselves so that we won't be that afraid or that at least not that much afraid anymore because we can take control of our destinies and this is something that's that i think about especially when engaging with like people who have had like way more climate um impacts who, who have experienced way more climate impacts than i have because you know if you have a very like hard existence it's very difficult to sort of see like far into the future of how things can get better so I think with art and design, it gets people to sort of smile a little bit and see how we could look at our situation from a more macro perspective. Catherine, that was a really great answer. And it just occurred to me, and I think of the scientific process and how scientists get grants and such. And you mentioned that, you know, with art, it, it, there's the heart there, there's emotion. And I think a lot of scientists, it's drilled into them that you shouldn't bring any of that. And you talk about the tensions between nature and technology. And I just see the tensions between art and science. And I think you're trying to bridge those. But I mean, what practically can we do? Scientists get these grants. I mean, can you build in as part of those grants? Okay, 5%, 10% is the communication and art needs to be part of that. I mean, it, it seems like some real drastic recommendations are going to be needed to get scientists to really appreciate art as a way to communicate what they're doing. Right. I think because I got my start in the climate change arena by working in a lab. Um, so with scientists, but as an artist. At the same time, I've been trained as both an artist and a scientist. So I do think um, there's a lot of empathy I've had to bring in on my part and being able to speak the language of scientists and artists and the public. So all of that different languages you've had to sort of master. And, and I think it's, it's because I think if, you, if you're in a particular field, there's a certain set of um, expectations that, you know, people who write grants um, would give would have for for you and actually as an artist i do run on a lot of grants so i write like a lot of grants like every month so i sort of know like you know what's the format that they need at the same time i think with art there's a little bit more room for play i it's been said to me that it takes a special kind of artist to be able to work in this type of um, space like i can't go in you know thinking okay we can just paint our feelings there has to be like very very specific and concrete questions that you need to ask and because I'm bringing in with um, a lot of like years of experience like a lot of like case studies I've had before so it makes it a lot easier each year to get people to um, accept that maybe we need we do need art and design um, and be able to build like our futures collectively okay I want to go back to a point you made earlier about the you were working with the students uh, on adaptation and I'm just curious a lot of people don't even really understand what adaptation is 
when it comes to climate change. How did you sort of, you'd mentioned that they sort of got in, they were dealing with in ways that you didn't, but did you have to literally define what adaptation to climate change really means? I mean, how did you do that? So um, these are kids, I mean, they were um, children that were part of like the plant communities. I think we don't really mention like adaptation in workshops. I usually go in with a more like layman's um, terms. Um, so instead of saying adaptation, I would say like, how do you see the future? What are the difficulties you think will happen? Like based on your previous experience. So I mean, I've had kids who were affected by these um, hurricanes. And so they really saw like their houses flood, their, some of the houses um, like flew over their heads and things like this. And so because of that, um, if you bring in a very layman set of terms, um, adaptation, I think, is going to be another loaded term. Like, I think climate change is a very political term. And I think things like adaptation, all of these like terms are going to be even more, it, it will be perceived as more dry in the future. So I think if you go in like with more human terms, like um, what do you see Like when you see like a beach? Are you scared? And if you are, then why? I think those are the, the things I would focus on as an artist. I want my listeners to, to go away with some very practical advice on the use of art. And so, you know, I have adaptation professionals who are working on adaptation plans. And I need to mention this green guide that, that she's developed with WWF. What can they literally do to integrate art into what they're doing? In a, and I guess in a very practical manner. I think in terms of being able to imagine um, solutions that may not be there in a very in other disciplines where the boundaries might be more set, I think art has that advantage of being able to think outside the box because in art, there is no box. So if you use art and design in, to integrate it in these um, like initiatives, I think a lot of like not, um, non-profits would often ask me for these things. I would say like look at a wide variety of media so I don't just do um, visual art. Sometimes we do like olfactory art. So it's about like scents. So we're looking at scents and what memories people have of them. And that's a very atypical way of being able to think about climate change and adaptation. Um, because, it, for example, um, I would get people to create perfumes of things that they would lose because of climate change. And what are the memories that um, they would lose? Um, so it gets um, the community to think about what is important to them, and you, you can take those and um, list them down and see, okay, what's a future community that's resilient enough to be able to preserve these memories, for instance. So I would say, um, in terms of like practical advice, just cast a very wide net. I think there is no medium that is useless. I think you will be able to find a fit. Um, each question will require like different solutions, and if you get like a um, a variety of artists who are able to think about these things in very atypical ways. I think um, you, you'll probably be able to find like a lot of like a very eclectic variety of outcomes. Okay, I have a two-part question as a follow-up sure. to that. So, with our flood green guide, we're hoping that people using that will be inspired to envision a different future where natural and nature-based features are part of portfolio of flood management options. And that is a little bit similar to climate change adaptation where we want people to envision a different kind of future and move towards that future in a positive way. So I'm wondering what your experience tells you about how art can affect both behavior change in people and learning in people. And then the second part is, since you're a scientist as well as an artist, can you say a few words about the science behind how art changes behavior change in learning? So, for example, do we know, in fact, that art does these things and how well it does it? Is that captured using the scientific method, if you will? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, okay. So that's the second question. I mean, there's a large body of work about the science, like neuroaesthetics and things like this. But for me, it's like, I'm not really interested into seeing whether art works because I feel like from a human perspective, we know it does. I think art has a lot to do with, I, I often speak a lot about how art can change social norms because honestly, when I was younger, I didn't really think so much about art. It was only when I was older when I realized that there were so many art projects that really moved me enough to be able to do something like this. And so in, 
in terms of like art changing people's minds, I do go about it from a very first person perspective in the sense that you know what, art was able to change my mind in terms of certain things, and I'm I'm dedicating my life's work to the environment. So I, I think in terms of、um, art being able to change social norms, I think it's because. We can, because of art and design, we can actually think of new worlds, new alternative norms,、um, if you will, that、um, make people can make people think that you know we can actually do things differently. And I think that's one thing missing for people who are like doing like the nine to five daily grind because they're they're on autopilot and they kind of like take for granted that、like, it's just going to be like this. But for art, because it's very unexpected sometimes. It can sort of shock people to, to to make them think. Okay, there's so many different things we can actually do. Thank you. I have w- one last question. I don't know, Anita. Do you have additional questions before I kind of do this wrap-up questions? No, I'm so inspired now. I'm going to move into art. <laughs> <Yeah> . I, I totally agree. About it. anyone can be an artist. You just, I think most of us don't even try, though. I don't think we can all be great artists. But how often do we go to an art class or anything? You know,、right. we, we don't even try. <laughs> Okay, Catherine. This has been great. So, do you have any sort of final reflections on, on the role of design, art, in in the use of comp into the you know you using those in complex issues such as addressing floods and climate change adaptation? I think for artists and designers, we actually have a lot of、um, leeway in terms of being able to pr- propose very atypical and unusual things. And I think especially for artists, we can go. F- You know, we have like so many different media to to work with, and especially for artists or good artists, I feel like you're supposed to be unafraid to be able to do things that no one else has done. We are not as constricted in the straitjackets of like grants, like for in other fields, for instance. So I would say that it's it's good for artists to be able to work with scientists because I do feel that it makes their work. More culturally adaptable to certain communities because artists can talk to people at the human level, and for communities that、um, science may may want to impact,、um, I think we, they can look at artists to be able to speak to them, like explain to them why you know the science is important to their lives, for example, and how why science can be important to、um, their futures, for instance.、Um, I think there's a large gap. That I see between science and the public, and I think artists can do a lot to be able to bridge that gap. Awesome, awesome message. Thank you so much, Catherine, for coming on.、You've, this is very inspirational, and I think hopefully、uh, people out there doing science can learn to appreciate art more in the role of communicating that science. And any final thoughts, Anita? No, this has been really inspirational for me as well. I don't consider myself a scientist, but thanks to this conversation, I might just rethink that. Uh, both a scientist and an artist. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> cool. You're welcome. And thank you for having me. It's been really fun. That is a wrap, adapters. Okay, so I want to close out this episode by getting Anita back on to kind of do a a summary of what we just heard. Hey, Anita. So, what did you think of our three guests? I really enjoyed talking with them and learning from them, and I think they have a lot to offer. What we're trying to do with our flood management work, so that was really exciting for me. Okay, so did you learn anything sp- particularly new from from any of these speakers? Well, I think we learned about how difficult it is to define what a community is, and I think those of us who work with communities and particularly in, in non government organizations, we've gotten to, into a habit of just saying the community, and there is no such thing as the community. It, it Can be so many different sectors and attributes that、uh, those of us who want to work with the community, I think, need to do a little bit more thinking around how do you even define what a community is. Okay, so I used to work in a previous life as an adaptation practitioner, and I felt like there was very few opportunities when you think about the grants or the project money that you have to really build in this sort of creative science communication, this creative engagement. And how are you doing it? And sort of how to my listeners out there that they would like to do something similar? What would be some practical ways for them to kind of move on these things? Well, I think in terms of doing it more, I think we are doing it, and I think we're trying to. Be creative, and and the guests we had today are examples of that. And we're doing it in efforts like this, like this podcast. And you are working with educators and 
on how to use a podcast in the classroom, for example. And so there are resources and experts out there and creative people out there to call upon. And sometimes it's just a matter of taking advantage of opportunities, unforeseen opportunities that present themselves. So, for example, I learned about Liz Miller and the work that she's doing with um, the Shoreline Project through a person I happened to meet at a, at a conference. And Catherine talked about Plan International, an NGO who contracted her uh, to help them with engagement around community climate change adaptation. And so I think it is happening. I just think that uh, we who often are trained to think in our professional or sectoral boxes need to put more effort into stepping outside of those boxes and, and looking around at things that may be available to us that could be very helpful. Yes, I agree. And I uh, applaud you guys at World Wildlife Fund that you kind of step outside the box and you, you're, you've you worked with me several times using a podcast. And I not that my listeners have to necessarily use a podcast, but sometimes I think they you kind of bake in your approach. Oh, I'm going to do a report and sort of the standard things that come with reporting out on these all these really important and sometimes really cool things, but just communicating people just, I think, go into default position. So I encourage you to think about what even our guests are doing and be a bit more creative in sharing this information because so much good work is really happening out there and it just lands with a thud. So uh, hopefully we can learn from them. Definitely. And I know I'm learning from this process and will build in this type of engagement into future work that I do. And I hope that um, the donors that are out there supporting this good work will also engage in the same way. You know, I, as an aside, I think about like, I, I work with you and I work with Sean Martin at WWF and you guys have to basically become content producers. You work with me on these episodes and you're probably doing things you didn't think you would be doing or have done before. And hopefully it's a, it's a bit fun for you. You know, you're helping produce this podcast. So may, I, I'm assuming there's some new things that you're doing. Definitely. And that's why I love what I do. And I just feel so fortunate that I have the job that I do because it just demands creativity. And I'm fortunate that the people I work with, folks like Sean, get that. And so we explore and grow this type of thing together. Not everything works. Um, and, that, and that's part of the learning process. But uh, that's also what I feel is exciting about working in this thing called climate change adaptation. You just have to learn that, you know, it's it's not going to be the same as it was in the past. And so that keeps it very fun and interesting. And of course, Doug, your joy to work with always. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, let's wrap this up by giving people a preview of the third episode. And it's not going to be our return of the, the Jedi. There's not going to be any Ewoks <laughs> in this episode three. So what can we expect in episode three? Well, I don't know. We shouldn't play that down too much. We're in episode three. We're going to go to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the work that they are doing to create guidelines on uh, the use of natural and nature based features for flood management. And people may be saying, Oh my goodness, not another guideline, but this is a different process and it involves people from all over the world looking at this issue and we were fortunate to be able to have conversations with a few of those and their partners and I think your listeners will learn a lot from that episode as well yeah I got to go out to Santa Cruz California and have these conversations it was really cool and I'm looking forward to sharing that but thanks for coming on Anita until the next episode this is America Daps. thanks Doug thanks for the work that you do Okay, Adapters, that is a wrap. Thanks to Anita, Vidya, Liz, and Catherine, three amazing experts doing incredibly important work. We need to bridge the gap between scientists and the general public through better communication, and these guys are on the front lines of doing that. Please check out their work in the show notes. Episode three of this flooding series should be out early in the new year. Stay tuned for those upcoming episodes. If you want more information on my guest or the green guide that was mentioned many times, links are in the show notes. Some final housekeeping. Don't forget to join the Facebook page and the Facebook community group. The group is private, but search for America Daps and ask to join. And boom, you're in. It's a chance to hear some insider info on the podcast. Actually, some great conversations have come out of that group. Okay, some quick shout out. Thanks, Cuyahoga H2O, for your Twitter love. Thanks, Dale. Thanks, Jack Morris in Australia. Thanks to Ella Butternet. And thanks, Sweta Chakaborty, for joining my advisory committee. 
Thanks to Climate Nexus for regular promoting the podcast. I know I'm missing some folks here, but thanks again to everyone who contributes to what I'm doing here. On that note, I love hearing from you. And with this new thing I'm doing, Letters from Adapters, it's a chance for you to ask some questions or just share what you're doing or if you have thoughts and ideas about the podcast. Seriously, it's a highlight of my week hearing from you. Sometimes it leads to really cool things. I'm at americaadapts at gmail.com. Send me an email. Check out the website at americaadapts.org. All this information is in my show notes, especially the link to the donate page. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.